Today's episode was originally featured in our Web3 Breakdowns feed. For listeners unfamiliar with Web3 Breakdowns, the concept was inspired by business breakdowns, but intended to be a place fully dedicated to the emerging ecosystem around blockchains, crypto assets, and everything that makes up Web3. This breakdown of Anchorage Digital has a foot in both camps by diving into a business that's enabling traditional institutions to participate in and profit from digital assets. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to subscribe to Web3 Breakdowns and enjoy our growing catalog of episodes. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, an integrated solution that provides an advanced trading platform, secure custody, and Prime services so you can manage all your crypto assets in one place. Coinbase Prime fully integrates crypto trading and custody on a single platform while giving clients the market's best all-in pricing through their proprietary smart order router and algorithmic execution. Coinbase Prime extends beyond individuals, with companies like Tesla and MicroStrategy using the investing platform to execute some of the largest trades in the industry. Coinbase is the only publicly traded company with experience trading and custodying crypto assets at scale. Build a unified investment portfolio with the most trusted name in crypto. Learn more by visiting coinbase.com slash prime to get started. This is Web3 Breakdowns. Web3 Breakdowns is a series of conversations exploring innovation in the decentralized internet. Each episode, we will focus on a different topic. We will cover NFT projects, crypto assets, blockchain-based protocols, and businesses being built with Web3 architecture. We will talk to founders, artists, investors, and influencers to understand this emerging ecosystem. Come join us down the rabbit hole to find more episodes, transcripts, and a library of content to continue your learning, visit joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts and podcast guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. My guest today is Diogo Monica, co-founder and president of Anchorage Digital. Diogo started Anchorage in 2017 to meet the growing institutional need to custody and use crypto assets. The business has since grown into a full service financial platform for institutions, allowing them to securely participate in Web3. Our discussion breaks down Anchorage's business, explores what great digital security looks like, and reveals what new behaviors Web3 is unlocking for traditional institutions. Please enjoy this breakdown of Anchorage Digital. So Diego, maybe the appropriate place to begin to introduce the audience to Anchorage is to understand why you got into this business in the first place. What was the seed interest, the seed idea, insight, however you want to take the question? How did this all begin? It's actually a really fun story, but I do have to make it a long story medium. And so I have to take you back about 12 years ago, because it was 12 years ago when I joined a very early stage company called Square. The reason why that's relevant is because I joined the same week as my now co-founder, Nathan McCauley. We actually joined Square employees 40th and 40 something, and we led the security team at Square for four years. That was the beginning of Anchorage in a way. Before Anchorage, I was working on something that was not particularly helpful or useful 15 years ago, which was a PhD in distributed systems and security, which in the world of blockchain obviously has some use since all of blockchain is distributed. Little systems. did you know what you were training for. <laughs> I did not know. It was just an academic pursuit to be a doctor is necessary to belong to my family. Not an if, it's a when. <laughs> so Nathan and I actually met, worked together for four years. Cool claim to fame. We actually have the patent on the little encrypted credit card reader that I'm sure you've swiped your card on. Oh yeah, of course. Cool. Yeah. We produced that, manufactured in China, did the design, firmware, hardware. It was, it was really, really fun times to be part of that team and see that company grow from 40 to over a thousand people, Series A company to a publicly traded company. And then we actually moved together to a company called Docker, where we led the security team for three years. Totally different world, but open source, security, running on all the G2000 infrastructure companies. And so that was a really interesting, unique experience to learn a lot about sales, about deployment of infrastructure security at scale, selling to three-letter agencies, which was really fascinating to see those security models and attacker models. And then finally, to answer your question, that brings us to 2017. Nathan and I were still at Docker. And what happened was these crypto funds or VC firms or family offices, which were all very sophisticated investors, turns out weren't very sophisticated when it came to key management and operational security. And so there was a fund that reached out to me 
because they had lost the passphrase to a $1.5 million Bitcoin wallet. And they offered me 20% if I could break into it. So that was my introduction to this business. Very sophisticated investors, not very sophisticated when it came to private key management or just password management, really. And so more and more institutions started coming to us. We started talking to them, helping them out until we realized we just didn't have enough time in our day. So we always wanted to start a company together. We had been working every day for seven years at that point. We're just the right team, two security engineers with the right background, the right place, the right time. So what we wanted to build was an institutional platform that allowed all these institutions to safely, but easily invest in crypto assets. And the way that that started was custody, but very quickly it evolved for all these other businesses that we now offer, such as trading, lending, financing, staking, so on and so forth. I want to ask, of course, a ton about Anchorage and crypto and all the stuff that you're focused on, but I'm glad you told the story this way because I am really interested in digital security of all kinds. Actually, what got me interested in crypto early on was a deep dive on SHA-256. The cryptography aspect of it was really, really cool to me. I don't have a better word than that. And so I'd love to just understand, maybe you could give us like kind of an overview about digital security. Like if you were teaching an introductory course about security as you had practiced it at Square and Docker and now at Anchorage, what would be like the major chapters of that syllabus or something? What matters? What should people know about the state of digital security and kind of what matters in that world, generally speaking? There's quite an area, wide spectrum of what security actually is, but maybe I'll split it into maybe two main categories. I could split it maybe in 10, but let's go with two categories. There's one category Candidly is the one that people should focus the most of their time on, especially when you're talking about cybersecurity and all of these compromises, which is corporate security. So internal security of your infrastructure. This covers anywhere from identity of employees in your company to their laptops, what's running on their laptops, who has access to what. This is, by the way, how Google got hacked, Aurora, where there was actually access to email accounts of Chinese dissidents. This is how Twitter got hacked. This is how hacks happen at Facebook, which is you compromise the developer machines and then you run rampant through the infrastructure because of effectively the privilege that engineers and all of these folks have within the infrastructure. So this happens over and over again and continues to be one of the soft bellies of security. It's usually the corporate component and the corporate part of it. Then there's the other aspect in which, obviously I spent a lot of time on corporate, but primarily my career has been focused on product security and production security. So when you're creating a card network or when you're storing tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of transactions on a yearly basis and hundreds of millions of credit cards, how do you store them? And how do you securely create hardware? And how do you encrypt data between the little square card reader and the servers? How do you make sure that these transactions can't be faked? Or how do you make it hard for somebody with an iPhone to steal these transaction data? All of that is product and production security. And so there, I would say that there are coding and secure coding principles, which are incredibly important. And then there's cryptographic principles and the principles of the actual foundations of cryptography, the type of tool belts that you have as a developer and an implementer of a system. You mentioned hashing. There's also public-private key pairs. There's signing there are uh, many different types of concepts. And there may be the third one that is very relevant right now and maybe leaking a little bit into the conversation to blockchain. There's a lot of consensus and distributed systems principles of how you can operate securely on the internet when there's no root of trust. And so there's also these concepts around public key infrastructure, how to distribute trust, how to manage identity, how to rotate credentials and certificates, how authorize users, how to authenticate users. These are also core concepts of security that, that need to be taken care of. But depending on how you come at the problem, there's many different things that we can talk about and building blocks that we can talk about. Maybe I'm oversimplifying, but does it all come down ultimately to like, what we care about is there are databases, which are sort of systems of record for key information that matters for people, a number in your bank account, ownership of an asset on a public blockchain, whatever, access to your front door. <laughs> really what matters is can we enable the right people to access an underlying database or not? I've been interested in these companies that are trying to kill passwords. I think one's called Stitch. We're getting closer and closer to the human. Like you can't fake being me. <laughs> it's very hard to like fake being me. Is that the right way to think about this? We're just talking about protecting databases and 
we're going to inch ever closer towards like perfect authentication for access to basic databases? I do think that data protection, which is what you're describing, is one of the core components and one of the hardest things to do, primarily because modern companies and modern infrastructure are made to aggressively persist data and collect and never delete. And the best data or the easiest data to protect is data that you don't have. So that's actually the easiest way of doing security is just don't collect the data in the first place. But what if what you're doing is collecting massive amounts of data obviously becomes very hard to protect it. And eventually at some point in the future, if it's a monotonic increasing function of data gathering, at some point it will go wrong. And when it goes wrong, all of it effectively ends up being exposed unless you did something to protect against it. The other element of what you talked about is identity and how do you know that this is Diogo or this is Patrick. And to that extent, there are also downsides. I think you're absolutely right. Um, biometric identity is one of the ways that people are going forward, but not all biometrics are the same. Not all ways of collecting biometrics are the same. It is very hard for, or maybe let me put it this way, when you are doing a touch ID on an iPhone or a face ID on an iPhone, some or all of the data is actually collected locally to unlock your device and it's actually not being sent to the cloud. But there's many other aspects, for example, IDs from a picture of your face on a browser, or we've talked a lot about the IRS wanting to actually have this visual identification of the taxpayers that was based on a photo. That's a very different thing. Then you have to consider that there's all these other issues. There's videos that can be replayed. There are pictures that can be replayed. Yes, your retina can be faked, but a really high resolution of picture of your retina can be taken and then mimicked. So how do you know this is actually a real-time conversation with Patrick and this is not actually relayed? And so it becomes really hard it's not that the biometrics just solve this issue. No, no, no. There's all these other issues to consider. And so it's really still an unsolved problem. There's also privacy aspects, by the way, because once you actually start putting all of your identity and your biometric markers out there, it's very easy to take a fingerprint from you. It's very easy to take a picture of you, potentially with a high resolution camera. All of our cameras are getting better and better. So maybe I can actually take pictures of the features that are being used for biometric recognition that I can then relay. So it's a really, really hard problem. But you're right that data is the main thing that we're trying to protect and that identity is being thoroughly researched because over the past 20 years, we've seen that the status quo of username and passwords and even 2FA hasn't really worked for the majority of the population. Because even though in certain settings, you can secure a system such that it's actually very hard to be compromised, the large majority of us don't do it. And the large majority of people are not very sophisticated and don't know how to configure it in the first place. And so it's maybe goes into the difference between security and safety and something that is secure and something that is safe that matters, right? Because something that can, can be configured in a way that meets a certain attacker model can be considered secure. But if it's hard to do it, it's not safe. If it's easy for you to shoot yourself in the foot, then you don't have a safe system, even though technically you can say that a weapon might have an actual security mechanism that doesn't allow you unless you actually unlock it to shoot. And so these two things are actually fundamentally different. At Anchorage, in our business, a lot of this is hiding the complexity of what it takes to protect tens of billions of dollars on private keys and hiding it away in a system that is very usable so that it doesn't allow you to do the wrong thing. Great excuse to talk about maybe the most interesting modern aspect of data or information, which is ownership. And public blockchains especially are so interesting in this regard. Maybe you'll use a gold analogy. Custody becomes very interesting. Like, do you store your gold in a lockbox at a bank that's fireproof? Or do you put it in a safe in your basement and you have some guns to protect it or something? Like, custody is a thing historically, which seems to wax and wane. There's lots of different ways of owning stuff. And I'd love you to describe those ways as you see them in the modern world of blockchain. I'm an investor in a company called Casa, which is a self-custody solution for Bitcoin for people. There's solutions that are more centralized. You know, there's a spectrum. So help us understand that spectrum, the trade-offs that different points at the spectrum represent. And that'll be a great bridge into talking about Anchorage more specifically. To talk about the spectrum there, maybe we start with talking about Bitcoin, which is arguably the most decentralized cryptocurrency and obviously the first one that created the category itself. Bitcoin has this main advantage that comes out, which is the fact that it is completely decentralized. There is no ability for centralized parties to seize, to inflate, and to freeze transactions of um, money that you own. And to do so, they put the responsibility of ownership 
of the asset itself onto the owner as a bearer instrument. So as you mentioned, it would be the equivalent to a gold bar or fiat cash in hand, a physical representation of, in this case, value that you own and that you can actually prove as a bearer instrument. It has tons of advantages. You can carry yourself. It is anonymous. And th- there's all these advantages. There's also these advantages, of course, in the particular case of gold, it's incredibly heavy. And cash also gets pretty heavy if you start uh, trying to move massive amounts of cash. So the physical nature actually plays against it. I think one of the aspects that the community talks about quite a lot in crypto in general, but in Bitcoin in specific, is the fact that it is your right, but maybe your duty to do self-custody. I would say that the fact that it is your right and that you have this right and cannot be taken away from you is actually the core of why Bitcoin is so special. And I wouldn't really focus on the elements of self-custody as much I would focus on the elements of permissionless innovation in the sense that nobody can stop you from interacting with the network. And the current solution that we found effectively comes at that by ensuring that there is their instrument and there is self-custody. And so you can own your own asset. The fact that you can own it is the thing that matters. It doesn't mean you have to. I would say that it's very reasonable when it comes to money, when it comes to elements of value for you to diversify your risks. We know this concept from investment. And so the same way that you wouldn't put all of your gold bars in your basement or at your house or all of your cash in case there was a fire and all the cash was now gone alongside your documents and alongside your house, you obviously, it doesn't make sense for you to do so with digital assets. So I think the fact that you can do self-custody is incredibly important, but it doesn't mean that you should. And when you are actually choosing your own risk profile, it's perfectly reasonable for you to have some self-custody and some custody that is a third-party custody. That is a perfectly reasonable outcome here. There's obviously a lot of religion around Bitcoin. It was the only way to form this phenomenon, but the religion sometimes goes in directions that might not actually be beneficial to the actual individuals. And I think this is one of those cases. For Anchorage, I just want to point out that in my business, we're not talking about individuals. We only onboard institutions and institutions are a very different beast. Number one, there's no one decision maker in an institution. It's actually a collection of individuals, a collection of shareholders. So there needs to actually, in certain cases, by law, a third party, we call it in terms of registration, a qualified custodian. The SEC requires that RAAs, registered investor advisors, actually custody their assets with a third party qualified custodian. So there's an actual legal designation for what the third party needs to be. So in certain cases, as an institution, you're actually forced to custody outside. And it doesn't mean that you have to. For all institutions, someone that does not have this regulatory requirement can do it themselves. But then you also have to understand that there's a reason why Anchorage exists and companies like it, which is we're specialized in protecting tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars of private keys in a way that is just not possible for any institution or fund or set of investors to really mimic without having had the background and hundreds of people working on the problem and solving what are very, very hard custody problems. This is where I think I sit in the spectrum. Self-custody is necessary. Even more important than self-custody is this permissionless ability to any participant to participate in the system, there can't be an oligopoly of banks that come around and effectively close off participating in the system like we have in traditional finance. And that allows anybody to come and compete. But all of this does not mean that it is your duty to do self-custody. It is your right. And you should choose whether you want to do it or not and whether it makes sense for you. And in some cases, you'll have some of it. And in some cases, you'll diversify away and store with third-party custodians that are specialized in doing this and thus more trustworthy in general. So I'd love to dig in then to what great means for a qualified institutional custodian in your view. So if you are the counterparty responsible for, you know, fill in the blank institution, storing a billion dollars of Bitcoin, what does that process look like? What is the actual product of custody? What have you built in the literal sense that protects, creates that security and safety And how does that improve? What does great mean in the sense of custody? Because it's so easy to think in physical analogies and you start wondering, well, the Fort Knox analogies start to pop into your brain. But what does it mean in a purely digital sense to be a great custodian for institutions? When we started this in 2017, the status quo, and it's still very much one of the ways that many of these players do security for these digital bearer instruments 
is the same way that you did security in the 1700s if you were a pirate and you were storing gold coins. You have gold coins, you put them in treasure chests, you bury them on an island, and then you have a little map so you don't forget where you actually stored it. <laughs> and you're laughing, but it's the equivalent in the modern world. Yeah, I know a lot of people that have buried a uh, key somewhere. That's right. And it's not an island. It's a safety deposit box in the bank somewhere. And it's not a map. It's actually a checklist. And it's not a gold coin. It's a smart card or some kind of ledger or something like that. The effective process is the same. We are protecting a digital asset with physical security. So guns and steel. That is the instinct. I understand why that's the instinct, because we can reason about it. And it's very hard for somebody that doesn't understand digital security to reason about digital security the same way they can reason about the safety of their house, which is something that is a lot closer to them and a lot more understandable. So that's actually what the status was in 2017. Institutions only had the ability to, to store these things doing what I uh, lovingly call pirate custody. That was the status quo. What we did was take all of the experience of two security engineering founders that came at the problem with fresh eyes and said, hey, we've actually built systems like this before. It is a new type of asset that has never actually concentrated this amount of wealth and money into private keys. But the problem is not dramatically different from what we're actually doing all of our careers. And so we had to come at it and create new things. But ultimately, we actually were very familiar with the process and very familiar with the cryptographic constructs, the primitives, how to protect these things, what the best of breed was at the time, and what the gap needed to be to go from public key infrastructure to $100 billion sitting on a private key somewhere. So what we did was we looked at what actually worked in cold storage. The thing that works in cold storage is this air gap, this guarantee that nothing is ever connected directly to the internet, that there's a physical guarantee here in the form of a vault, because the vault is not connected to the internet, and so it's physically separate. That's the guarantee that cold storage pirate custody actually has that is very interesting. On the other end, you have to think about the worst part of a process-based solution is that it requires humans. And since humans are not robots, we can't expect them to do the same thing every single time, the same way, and do it right. So what we did was we took the best portion of cold storage, which is this air gap nature or this air gap notion, and we removed the worst part of cold storage, which is the human implementation. And we created a system that effectively works the same, but using robots instead of using humans. And so conceptually, what that looks like is think of an air gap in space. How does an astronaut go from the inside of the space station to space to do a spacewalk? Well, they're inside of the space station. They have to pressurize the little capsule. They have to open the inner door. They go into it. They close the inner door. They depressurize it. And then they open the outer door and then their spacewalk. And then they come back and do the opposite. So there's a way for you to completely separate the inside from the outside. If there was a direct connection, the space station would not have any air. We know how to do this. And this is obviously not a perfect analogy, but a good enough analogy for what we do for signing payloads and signing transactions for Bitcoin and all these cryptocurrencies. So that's one of the things that we did. The second thing that we did that is extremely important that we mentioned is we went above and beyond in terms of authenticating the human and the intent. And what I mean by that is that Anchorage was the only company that actually went all the way to understand, is this actually Patrick? And is Patrick wanting to do this operation? We had to answer questions like, is this Patrick or Patrick's device doing the operation? Is Patrick's device compromised? Does this match the pattern of behavior of Patrick? What about the company's behavior? We can't let a single human be a single point of failure. And so we have quorum systems that guarantee in our systems that there's no single human or individual that can ever do unilaterally transact out of the system or can do transactions unilaterally that protects both the company and you because you can't be held at gunpoint and unilaterally actually move transactions. And then we had to do biometric authentication, as you mentioned. So identifying who the human is behind the device and identifying it not just one biometric marker, but as many biometric markers as we can get our hands on and then collect all this metadata that allows us to actually make a concrete judgment call of whether this is Patrick and Patrick has the intent of moving this transaction and whether the institution alongside Patrick wants to have assets leave the platform. And this is not easy. In fact, I would say that the key management portion of this, the air gap, the pirate custody, the storing the keys, key generation, the randomness, making sure that the keys are correct. All of that is just a third 
of the solution to the problem. And it's the elements of the solution that get the most attention, but it's actually end up being not really the hardest part of the solution. It has to be a full end-to-end view over the security of the system, the interaction with the human, the usability of the system. We mentioned usability before. If it's secure, but it's not usable, then it's not safe. And so all of these aspects have to be combined together to actually create a solution that works for institutions. What is the business of custody today in the digital world? How do you make money? Like, is it just a percentage of assets that are custodied? Is it some sort of flat fee that tears up and down? Like, how does the cost of this map back onto the revenue, if that makes sense? Because it sounds hard to develop, meaning lots of upfront cost. It also sounds expensive to maintain potentially. So just walk me through the business behind custody specifically before we get into some of the other things that Anchorage does too. Let me just agree that it's very hard to develop, especially because it's not just one asset. We support hundreds of assets, dozens of different blockchains, and we have to maintain them forever. All of them are different. All of them have different technology. Solana looks nothing like Ethereum. That looks nothing like Celo. That looks nothing like Flow. That looks nothing like whatever it is. Every single asset is different and they're incredibly complex and they're only getting more complex because their interactions are also different. Some do staking, some do governance, some have smart contract execution that doesn't work the same way that others do. It becomes very complex. To answer your question, is actually pretty straightforward. Because we are a qualified custodian, we are actually a bank. We have a federal charter by the OCC. We were the first ones to get it and we're still the only ones that have an operational federal charter for crypto. What we do is we do a business that is equivalent to a traditional custodian with many differences from a technology perspective, from a business-wise, it's very similar. So assets under custody, we charge a percentage on a yearly basis. For trading, we charge VIPs on each trade. For either lending or the financing, whether you want to borrow dollars against crypto collateral, it is net interest. For staking, is a percentage of staked gains. For settlements, is VIPs on transaction for each settlement. All of these business models are directly tied to the crypto business. What do we enable? We want to make sure that we're exposed to the upside. The way to think about it is you'll do well in high volume outcomes, where for all of these things, more dollar trading floor, more dollar custody, more everything, you've got not perfectly variable costs. I'm sure you have variable costs, but you've got a lot of fixed costs and you get to spread. Your business gets better as volume goes up margin wise and obviously therefore everything else wise. Yes. Anchorage gets better as volumes goes up as value of the crypto market goes up, as product market fit emerges on different verticals, and as complexity increases. Complexity benefits the people with the best technology. If what you're depending on is humans running around a safety deposit box to actually do transactions, you can't scale to millions of transactions, and you can't scale to hundreds and hundreds of assets. You're actually limited by how fast a human can walk. That's the limitation that your platform should really never have. Complexity benefits Anchorage, volume benefits Anchorage, different use cases for crypto benefit Anchorage, and of course, total market cap benefits Anchorage. If I think about some of the institutional analogs on Wall Street prior to crypto, you start to think about things like there's custody, there's prime brokerage, there's all these different services that institutions use that they don't own themselves. Where do those analogies fall down? And maybe another way of asking the question would be like, If you think back to your first big institutional client, who were they? Like, how did they engage with you? What was the first service? Like, how did you get them to trust you? They were first. It's a really interesting cold start problem. Maybe you could walk us through that example. Very hard cold start problem. I think we benefited from the fact that we had a great brand individually, Nathan and I. We had built these systems before. We built something that was unique. And when you saw it, you understood what we're going for. It wasn't opaque. It was very transparent in the nature that the process worked and that the product worked. Where you get lucky is, turns out that the people that are investing in cryptocurrencies first are the crypto funds. And the crypto funds are sophisticated by nature. They can actually judge your technology. They can do deep inspection. Today, very large institutions are relying on Anchorage because we have a SOC 1 and a SOC 2 and we have insurance and we have a no CC federal charter and we've been around for four and a half years and we've had external audits and internal audits. And it really is the collection of everything that has ever happened that makes institutions trust Anchorage. We have great investors, clients like Visa, government clients. So it's very obvious right now that Anchorage is beyond validated from every single walk of life. In the beginning, it was technology. We opened a Komodo and said, we have nothing to hide. This is just security, great security engineering. 
there is no secret sauce. It's just a collective decades of experience coming to bear on a problem that we're just uniquely qualified for. If you think about the story of Anchorage is this business is the perfect Venn diagram of our skill set. It is financing and payments expertise at Square, operational security at Docker of very large corporations, a lot of volume and distributed systems expertise as a PhD before that. And so the Venn diagram of skill set is literally private keys that are worth hundreds of billions of dollars of value. And so that's absolutely fascinating to be in the right place in the right time with the right co-founder and with the right background. So that was very unique. That was what allowed us to overcome the cold start problem that you mentioned is the fact that people trusted us. They validated it, they verified it, but they trusted us. And so the crypto funds were sophisticated enough to be able to look at the technology in a way that today people just don't as much because there's already so many other points of validation and proxies for security and proxies for safety that we've acquired over the past four and a half years. Can you say a bit about the speed of movement through the process? Because the third of it is sort of the air gapping equivalent. Two thirds maybe is the intent and the validation of identity and all the trickiness that comes with that. I'm sure there's a whole conversation to be had about both of those, but it sounds like it could take a while from an intent in my brain at institution XYZ to the trading of that asset that I've protected with you. Talk me through speed as a component of security and safety. Is it always a trade-off, meaning more speed or more quick access means less secure, or are there ways around that problem? No. In fact, speed as a proxy metric for security is what got us into this nonsense of calling it cold storage versus hot storage. Cold storage and hot storage actually comes from caching, from when something is hot, it's very quick and accessible because it's cached and it's right there in memory waiting for you uh, or in a proxy front end cache. And if something is in cold, means that it has to go all the way to database, has to execute the queries, has to run for the first time, and then it will be cached. And the next time you try to get it from the website, it'll be a lot faster. That's actually where we got hot and cold from. but Speed is not a good proxy metric for security. It is not just a dial that you go from faster to slower. So from colder to hotter. Security is actually a totally different dimension. It is more about, do I have the right authorization from the right sets of individuals? And do I know that they're actually the right individuals? And do I have enough context to understand whether this transaction is legitimate? Yes or no. That's actually the bottleneck here. To answer your question around how fast does one move a transaction outside of a system like Anchorage, there are two paths. There's the API path. It was a machine that requested the transaction, which the answer there is, you know, within minutes, depends more on the blockchain speed of confirmation. Bitcoin has a block every 10 minutes. So say 10 minutes later, the first block will be mined. And those 10 minutes will actually overshadow the time that it takes to go through the process. And then there's the human approved components or human approved transactions. And here, It's interesting because a machine is not the one initiating the transaction, already having pre-validated this transaction should go to this type of destination and that the volumes match up with what the rules should be. There's all these controls that it can put around API access. The humans, it's more divided in two components. The first one is how much time does it take for Patrick and the two other core members, or at least the other core member, only ever allow two out of three minimum? So two individuals out of three to actually move a transaction out of the system, but you can configure whatever you'd like in out of M. So you could say five out of seven, you could say seven out of 11, whatever you want. How fast can people actually get to that approval and get quorum on that? That is the first big question. Are people traveling? Are people available? Are they not available? This is a big problem, but it's how it should be if you're moving very large amounts of transaction. So the security elements are directly tied to how many assets you have in this vault. And how much you want to allow with what policy? Maybe for a transfer of a couple of million dollars, you're fine with the two out of three, two people approving the transaction. But for a transaction of a hundred million dollars, maybe you'd require five. And for $10 billion, you require seven. So all those things are things that you can do and configure on the platform and that allow you to actually get what you want, which is higher trust. And the time has nothing to do with this. Yes, seven people are likelier to take longer time to get to approval than five people or than three people. But a lot of the work that I mentioned in the beginning of making our platform not just safe, but usable, because security without usability does not work, was to create an actual 
product that was beautiful and that was easy and there was a pleasure to use. So we make heavy use of the iPhone, we make heavy use of secure enclaves and all of the biometric collection elements that the phone already provides us. And in fact, you can very easily get a push notification on your phone, you can have three or five people within minutes approving a transaction of $10 billion. So it is very fast. In minutes, you can get consensus, especially if people are already waiting for a transaction or expecting it to happen. You can get consensus of three people approving this transaction within a couple of minutes. And then there's the second component of the platform. For every transaction, we review it. We review it on the blockchain. We look to see what the origin is, what the destination is. We check OFAC compliance, all of these compliance elements that are checked. Plus, there's an internal risk review team and risk review systems that analyze all of the data points that we've collected. And in fact, for manual operations and transactions over a certain amount, they're all manually validated. And so there's a human in the loop, but the human is not touching key material. And we actually have over 95th percentile of our transactions happen under 15 minutes or 10 minutes, even the ones that need manual approval. And so it actually ends up being within blockchain speed, at least the Bitcoin blocks, which are obviously 10 minutes. So that would be the second component of review. So first you have consensus time and then you have review time. I'd love to understand how the business evolved from custody, which lines up so perfectly with your expertise and your personal and Nathan's story into things like trading and staking and governance and financing. Like these are natural extensions of, we've seen this in finance everywhere. Once you have assets, whether you're Schwab or Fidelity or some of the qualified custodians in the equity world, let's say, all of a sudden it makes sense to layer on lots of other services. You've acquired the customer, you've done a great job for them. There's other things they need that are related to their money or their Bitcoin in this case or whatever. Talk me through your progression away from custody into other services. How did it happen? How did you make those decisions? Clearly, you're differentiated on custody, right? Like that's the whole backstory. How are you differentiated in some of these other areas that's relevant to the customer? So the same way that the company started out of client need, we had clients before we had a product. All of these other expansions came from client demand. First, you needed a platform that could custody tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars worth of private keys and cryptocurrencies. And then institutions said, this is great, but I would love for this to be regulated. That's how the whole story to get us the first OCC chartered bank starts. And then they say, hey, Anchorage, I love this regulated custody platform, but wouldn't it be great if I could trade directly from the safety of custody? And to answer your question from a differentiation perspective, if you've already selected your partner for the hardest thing to do, which is to protect the assets while they're stored, then it doesn't make sense for you to go to trade with somebody else where you're actually exposing yourself to settlement risk. Where do these assets get settled? Where do they go to after I trade them? There are two things here that are interesting to point out. After trading, which is an obvious one, then people start asking us, can I borrow against the crypto collateral that I have at Anchorage? Can you lend out my crypto onto lending pools and generate yield out of it? You have my cello. Can I stake my cello? Can I do governance decisions with my cello? So all of these next business lines came out of need from the fact that we had the assets. And it points to an interesting difference between traditional prime brokerage and crypto prime brokerage. And traditional prime brokerage can actually come to the business at any layer of the stack. Since all the certificates are at DTCC, there's all of this set of introducing brokers and carrying brokers that ultimately when an issue arises, there is a traditional process. There's courts that allow you to actually verify ownership and there are trails of ownership and ownership can actually be changed. In crypto, that is not the case. If you don't have the private key, you have massive, massive counterparty risk. And so if you're trying to come into crypto to just lend crypto or borrow crypto or trade crypto, and you don't have your own custody stack, you quickly realize that is not a tenable way to do business. So that's just part of the reason why starting with custody was necessary. And it's different in the crypto world from the traditional prime brokerage world. In crypto, any business of the prime stack requires a custody stack. And you've seen this with mergers and acquisitions of companies that came at it from different angles and then ended up having to acquire or having to try to build their own solution because they couldn't have counterparty risk for their actual businesses. So that's a very differentiated set of advantages, which is the fact that we're the custodian, we have the private key, we already have the trust established of the institution. And then it doesn't make sense for you as an institution to go do business anywhere else because now you have to validate their custody stack and you're actually taking more risk on their custody stack, but you've already validated ours. So there's a huge incentive for you to trade through us. 
there's a huge incentive for you to borrow from us because your custody is already here. And thus, we are the ones that can extend you credit. There's a huge incentive for you to stake directly from Anchorage, all because the actual custody is the hardest element to get right. I think I saw somewhere that it's true. I know for Visa, when they bought the CryptoPunk, that you were the enabling security counterparty. I think it's true that there's a lot more to that, meaning whether it's punks or other NFTs, you've also become a custodian of a big chunk of that world. What has that experience been like? Are there any differences from your perspective, from Anchorage's perspective, securing a pixelated crypto punk versus billion Bitcoin? Like what are the different challenges and what gets you excited about this? Or is it just another version of the same problem? Well, it's both a great example of our business lines evolving based on our client demand. And I guess the best word to describe it is unexpected. This is a very unexpected portion of our business. It's not that we didn't contemplate that this was going to be a portion of our business at some point, is that it was unexpected, the rise of prices of NFTs, the success of NFTs, and really having a client somewhat jokingly forcing the issue and forcing us into it. So yes, we did the acquisition. We are custodying a CryptoPunk for a visa. And it's fun because we actually have an OCC federally chartered bank custodying crypto art custodying digital art. It's amazing. And of course, once that got announced, as you can expect, all these other clients came to us and said, wait a minute, if you have CryptoPunks, why don't you store mine? And by the way, if you have CryptoPunks, why can't you store my monkeys? Or why can't you store my apes? Or why can't you store my other types of NFTs? And so it's definitely been a flood of interest and incredibly interesting to have this business growing as fast as it is. From a product perspective, there are elements that are different and there are elements that are exactly the same. In fact, one of the underappreciated components of NFTs is that a crypto punk that is worth $10 million is the equivalent of $10 million worth of Bitcoin. And from a custody perspective, because it's an NFT and because it's a digital image, I believe people have this feeling where a $10 million crypto punk does not deserve the same type of security as a $10 million worth Bitcoin wallet. And I think we've seen this in real time with all of the hacks of the original holders of CryptoPunks and board apes that have not taken the security into, have not taken security as seriously as they would have if these were just simple tokens or traditional crypto assets. So there's a little bit of a gap here in terms of understanding at the end of the day that it's the same exact type of private key and the same exact type of interaction. And so, of course, NFTs by definition are not fungible. So it's harder for you to try to surreptitiously sell a specific board ape because naturally people will keep track of it. And it's very hard for you to try to run with that board ape and, and claim ownership of it or go to any kind of membership activity that requires proving that you have an ape without you exposing yourself as the criminal that stole this. So of course, kind of in terms of impact, it's very distinct, but it's still ultimately $10 million worth of value that you have to store with the same types of security principles. So that component is the same. One of the other things that's so interesting about a business like yours is you get to see behavior before it's publicly reported on or people become generally aware of something happening. And I'm curious what, not specific behaviors, but what general class of behaviors you find most interesting. Like one, as an example of what I mean, is the use by corporations and their treasury to keep some Bitcoin, let's say, in their treasury as part of the way they manage their own capital or something like this. We've seen this with like, say, Tesla or Square or a couple other examples, typically technology companies, extreme versions like the company MicroStrategy. So what have you seen, whether it's something like that, treasury management or new behaviors of institutions as a result of your sort of privileged view on the world? I think there are two that are particularly interesting. You've talked about the treasury management components of Capital preservation through taking some of your cash and buying Bitcoin or Ethereum with it, having crypto on the balance sheet has definitely been something that has been widely reported. So I feel like that one is not as interesting at this point. Similar but different type of taking advantage of crypto opportunities that treasuries are also on the lookout for right now. And it's actually one of the fastest areas of growth of our business is the fact that we can generate 79% return on cash. What does that look like? You wire us funds, you wire us dollars, and we turn dollars into more dollars through the inefficiency of traditional institutions not offering credit to institutions that have crypto. Maybe I'll reframe this and say it another way. If you have a billion dollars of Bitcoin 
and you go to a traditional financial institution and you say, can you lend me a hundred million against this billion dollars of collateral? They will say, absolutely not. Your billion dollars of Bitcoin is worth zero to me. I don't know how to custody it. I don't know how to price it. I can't do collateral management on it. I can't liquidate it. What do I do with this? You are a client with a billion dollars of value and you can't even get a hundred million dollars. You can get $1 million loan against a billion dollars of collateral. So right now there's all of these holders. There's all of these institutions, many of them clients of Anchorage that have crypto on Anchorage and want to either do arbitrage in the space or do leverage or wait for long-term capital gains versus short-term capital gains, or they want to run basis trade, or they want to run the GBTC trade or, or whatever it is that they're trying to do with more capital. They want dollars. They're desperate for dollars. And what they have to post up as collateral is crypto. And not only Bitcoin, we're talking about Ethereum, we're talking about Filecoin, we're talking about all of the long tail of assets of cryptocurrencies. And because there's no one that can custody these assets and price them and do collateral management, we get to do it for them and we get to charge quite high rates all the way to mid-teens, sometimes high teens in terms of interest. And that's actually where the yield is coming from. It's coming from the inefficiency of the market, extending credit to crypto holders. Right now, we have products, and again, we only work with institutions, not retail, where you get to generate 7 to 9% of return by taking the leap into not exposing yourself to crypto, but allowing clients to borrow dollars against crypto collateral. That's what's happening. And in many of these cases, these are over collateralized loans. There's $2 per dollar being lent out, or sometimes for more volatile cryptocurrencies that are $5 for each dollar. And so it's an extremely interesting risk trade-off that has all of these treasuries that are sitting on cash, looking at 7.5% inflation and saying, hey, this would be a great way to deploy some of my dollars to at least keep up with inflation or potentially even beat it. So that is an interesting treasury use case that is not the capital preservation or taking crypto onto your balance sheet that institutions are very excited about. The second one that I think is very interesting actually has more to do with other types of institutions like fintechs and corporates. It has to do with stable coins. They're coming into crypto and not actually touching any of the crypto like Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of the layer ones. What they're doing is they're coming straight to stable coins. They're looking at USDC and DAI and all of these stable coins and saying, wait a minute, you're telling me that there's a US dollar equivalent that I can settle 24-7 in some of these networks within seconds, and the fees are incredibly low. This changes their core business materially. There's changes their costs material. Think if you're a payroll company and what you're doing is effectively sending out dollars to different institutions or different participants in the network. And now you find yourself with a very fast blockchain with a dollar equivalent that you can send at any point in time of the day, and you can send that very fast. It actually not only makes your business a lot more efficient, your core business more efficient, but it actually opens up new avenues and new possibilities. For example, in blockchains, there's these concepts of streaming payments that you can do in a smart contract, which is effectively this faucet of money that can be funded and it opens up and can be consumed, which is really interesting because it's very hard to implement this type of primitive in the traditional finance world. Or imagine that you have a delivery service like DoorDash or Uber, where you can actually have payments go out after every ride, not after a week, not after a month, but after every ride, there's an instant payment that can actually go out. And that's cheap enough for you to implement in practice. So that's also a really interesting, really interesting type of use case that we're seeing more and more and more is the corporates and the fintechs waking up to stable coins as a much better settlement mechanism than Fedwire. Another way to ask the same fascinating question is just how the pie of your business looks today. You don't have to give me revenue or anything, but I'm just curious for whatever met proxy metric you think is right, whether that's assets under custody and for assets under custody, like asset management versus the visa institutions of the world versus corporate treasury, like whatever metrics you can give around volume or size or some understanding of the business and its various features would be really interesting. A year and a half to two years ago, 100% of our revenue was coming from custody. Now it's actually around or under 50%. Staking, trading, financing, and lending, and all of these settlement businesses are quickly, and it's not that custody is growing, 
it's decreasing. No, it's that these businesses are growing a lot faster. So our revenue is actually very diversified at this point. And 18 months to two years, we've diversified 50% of the revenue away from core custody product, which is absolutely amazing. In terms of numbers, we have tens of billions of dollars on the platform. We have many hundreds of clients. Uh, at some point very soon, I'm going to start seeing thousands of clients. And there's just this massive inflow of new types of institutions. In terms of types of institutions, four years ago, three and a half years ago, it was primarily family offices, crypto funds, and VC firms. Now we have very conservative players, allocators. We have LPs and crypto funds that are actually receiving in-kind distributions of VC funds investments. You have government agencies that are being forced to deal with crypto because they're seizing assets or financial institutions that have these assets on their balance sheet are actually going out of business and they need to handle it. Or you have companies like Visa that are looking at USDC settlement payment use cases or want to offer buy and sell of crypto to other institutions. Or you also have crypto native companies, the exchanges, the miners, and of course, traditional banks, both retail banks and institutional banks. And right now we're just having a lot more of these types of clients than we ever had before. Three years ago, the banks were coming to us and asking us what they should be doing in crypto. And today the banks are coming to us with very specific use cases and concrete product requirements and saying, can you help me build this? So it just has been a 180 shift in terms of their view onto the business. There's no large financial institution right now that doesn't have either a product in crypto being worked on or a crypto strategy right now. If you think about the future state of the business, what do you think the best case scenario is? Are the margins, are they like the best software companies? Are they like the best custodian brokerage companies like a Schwab in the public market? Like what is the most obvious path to really big, but also really profitable for Anchorage, do you think? I think there's a combination of both. There are definitely businesses here that speak more to the prime brokerage of the world than being an investment type of bank and thus having those types of multiples. But there's a lot of SaaS-like products and software-like products and revenue generation that come from some of these services. Staking revenue, it's a really interesting type of revenue for you to consider, which is neither of the traditional types of revenue that you're used to. And so it's very high multiples on assets or custody that because we're constantly adding new crypto assets, don't really compress that much. And they can compress for the most popular assets, maybe like Bitcoin or Ethereum that have been around for a while. There's dozens and dozens of new blockchains and new assets coming to place where you might be the only service and the only custodian, the only platform supporting them, which obviously commands a higher price because of your investment and because of the risk that you're taking. We constantly see this happening. That doesn't seem to be any slowing down of the types of innovations, types of assets that are coming to the space. And thus, that doesn't seem to be real compression happening in terms of the ability for Anchorage to charge. Plus, of course, as I mentioned, there's multipliers on a revenue like staking, like other services that are accessory. Say that at some point in the future, you're an institution that wants to participate in DeFi via Anchorage. That is the natural extension of our business too into higher order types of services instead of always staying on settlement or assets under custody or even just specific staking businesses. There's a world of financial instruments for us to explore. Again, because the keys are what matters and the keys control the asset itself, all of this aggregates to the actual platform and all this aggregates to the actual custodian. So I don't think we've ever seen an asset class like this where a lot of the value can accrue to a single platform versus actually being split across multiple different platforms. If you think about the future of this whole ecosystem, does it worry you at all that we may end up in a situation where some large majority of the assets by value, by economic value, are owned by institutions, which themselves are centralized and custodied with Anchorage or maybe Anchorage and a few competitors, which are centralized institutions? And you mentioned at the beginning, the important thing is the permissionlessness of the system. And it sounds like maybe the answer is that that can coexist with a concentration of wealth on a certain number of platforms or owners. But how do you think about that in the future? Like, what would worry you, I guess, about the future of this system if it developed a certain way, given its original promise and intent? I think if there were one or two players that had 80% of all of the assets in existence, that would obviously be not a single point of failure, but a double point of failure in this case of two institutions that actually hold the majority of the assets. I think that's a worrisome outcome, but it's not going to be a realistic outcome. We're already seeing that a lot of these businesses 
might actually follow the traditional view of the world where yes, there's two to three client, there's two to three institutions that take 40 to 60% of the market in certain regions. And there's a long tail of 10 or 12 institutions that take the rest of the 40%. I think the most important thing to maintain is one thing that you mentioned and that I've mentioned, which is nothing is stopping anyone from coming and competing with Anchorage. Bitcoin is an open ecosystem. Ethereum is an open ecosystem. Everybody can come in and, and compete with us and custody with us. There's no gatekeepers on these networks. And that's extremely, extremely important because as long as Anchorage continues innovating and providing best-in-class service, the only ones with the federal charter, the only ones with hundreds of assets, the only ones that have a fully integrated stack where we do staking and we do governance and we do trading and we do custody and we do financing. As long as we continue innovating and being the best, it makes sense for people to put assets on Anchorage. The moment that stops being the case, some other competitor will come up in a way that is just not really true of the traditional financing world. And you see that because some of these players are hundreds of years old. BNY Mellon has been around for over 200 years. State Street has been around for a long time. And JPM has been around for a long time. And that's despite some lack of innovation from the financial industry. And so in this case, that can't really happen because there's an open set of players that can come in and compete at the exact same level as Anchorage. Compete on the technology, compete on the service, compete on the product. What about the business have we not talked about that gets the most of your attention and time or you think is the most interesting opportunity or interpret it however you want? What are the aspects of it that we haven't touched on that you think are key or exciting? We've talked about this particular use case quite a bit in the past. It hasn't never really materialized or hasn't really materialized yet, but it is the security tokens. Right now, there's alternative trading systems that can actually trade these securities. And Anchorage is a bank, so we can custody these securities. The infrastructure is in place for us to allow the tokenization of really any traditional instruments, non-traditional instrument, new types of instrument, and kind of like bridging the world. And if you think about how many trillions of dollars that are in equities and how many trillions of dollars that are in mortgages and all these instruments that are asking, just begging to be tokenized and traded in a better manner and settled in a better manner and that is more efficient and more transparent, then you realize that there's just massive, massive potential that has been potential for quite a few years and has been talked a lot about. But then because there hasn't been that much obvious progress, regulation obviously is a highly regulated market and so it moves slower, people seem to not be paying as much attention to it anymore, even though it's a giant just sitting there waiting for the fire to start. And then once it actually picks up, I believe that all of the pieces are in place already. Once the fire starts, it's going to be very quick to consume portions, I'm not going to say all, of traditional finance. I think this actually leads me to my view of crypto is not that it's coming to replace traditional finance. Crypto is coming to bring competition to traditional finance because competition breeds better products for you and I. And so ultimately, I think this is one of the big big functions that crypto can play in the economy, in our economy, and really in the world is to bring competition and create better products. In the world where all those other securities are unlocked in the ways that you're describing, so instant settlement, faster trading, 24-7, programmatic possibilities, you know, I can send a share of Apple, like I could send a stable coin and program it however I wanted it or drip it out faucet style or whatever, all these exciting kind of visions of the future. How does that actually work, do you think, from a blockchain standpoint? Does somebody launch a public blockchain that's for equities? Does it happen on existing blockchains like Ethereum and Bitcoin or somewhere else? Like, What does that future look like? What is the actual base layer infrastructure that enables all of that? So there are portions of the infrastructure which are the regulated infrastructure that we've described. The ability to, from a regulatory perspective, to trade it. The ability to custody. The ability to settle it. So those are the first pieces of the puzzle that are in place now and that have been put in place over the past four to five years. And then there's the actual blockchain aspects that you're mentioning. In that view, I think the world is going to be a lot more multi-blockchain than the religion around different assets would lead you to believe, where I think different blockchains will specialize and they're already specializing. You have NFT-based and focused blockchains. You have blockchains that are focused on DeFi. You have blockchains that are focused on security tokens. Some of them that are focused on just being a great commodity and some of them are focusing on store value. There's already this specialization of different blockchains. And I think the same thing will happen here where security tokens will be issued on many different blockchains and some of them will succeed more than others. And those will become the de facto standard for issuance. 
And it might be two or three of them. And it's actually pretty easy in the blockchain world to make them interoperable. And so which blockchain actually ends up being on doesn't really matter very much because you can actually wrap them and trade them effectively across different blockchains, which is, I think, one of the beauties of this technology is the fact that there are easy ways, since there's programmatic smart contracts, for you to aggregate these worlds. It's hard. It's vulnerable. We've seen some issues and some hacks coming from the fact that security is very hard to do on the edges, and it's on these edges, on these APIs, on these integration points, so to speak, that a lot of the bugs and a lot of these issues show up. But it's possible because we have programmable money and programmable smart contracts that can actually move these instruments around. It's so exciting to think about how this might all change the world of finance in the future. It's been a pretty static set of institutions, set of technologies. Really cool to see what Anchorage is doing in this space. And I appreciate all the insight. I ask everybody the same traditional closing question. What is the kindest thing that anyone's ever done for you? I was a PhD candidate out of Lisbon, Portugal, that after receiving a couple of offers from Google and Facebook, decided to try his luck and apply to a really, really tiny startup called Square that when I applied was probably under 25 people, uh, 20 people. And I had the amazing individuals totally overlook the fact that I do not come from Stanford. I do not come from MIT. In fact, I come from a tiny, tiny country somewhere in Europe and took the time to read my papers, my thesis, to read my code and take a chance on me for what was a very, very high responsibility role. And so that wasn't necessarily kind, but I do think a lot about the fact that I got lucky so many times in my career. And I can definitely point to my Silicon Valley career, meeting Nathan, going from Square to Docker, from Docker to creating Anchorage, to that particular bet that somebody made on me. And let's be candid, remotely, it's a bet. And so there's a huge luck component that is involved here I love it. A very common answer. A constant reminder to take bets on other people too, when you don't necessarily need to. Diogo, thanks so much for your time. Thank you for having me, Patrick. To find more episodes of Breakdowns or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S.com. 